Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, all right. Clinical terms. In clinical terms, when we have a activated macrophage, on the left hand side you can see over here and there's a melanoma cell. Melanoma cell basically is a cancer cell and uh, many a times the objective for these cells is basically to kill, to kill that cell and that process is called the kiss of death. And that's a typical immunological term that we normally use and I'm going to give you some clinical history for that as well. So those of you who are near can read a case study and I'll discuss that. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read it. And those of you in the back cannot see, come closer. No, they are not. You don't need them. These are just for discussion points. And so, <laughs> okay. Shall I move? So basically, uh, Allergy. There was a news. Many. Uh, I mean, I would. What do you make of these news? Is it correct information that you've learned so far? No. No. Why no? You say you cannot die. What does the rest of the class think? Okay, uh, well remember this is the news, and let me give you a little bit a better news outlet, so that will give you a little bit better idea. Same report by BBC, and you see a little bit of difference, maybe those of you who want to understand immunology can make sense out of it. Let me emphasize, you can see basically uh, the time point. And uh, she was given adrenaline shock, which is a standard treatment for anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock is type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. That is true. And then again, uh, she was known to be extremely allergic. That is true. And then again, the other thing, keep in mind that she is about 155 miles away from the city where she was treated. So you can see that's another point over here, and a post-mortem, of course, was carried out, and a peanut allergist was called in. So that wasn't a joke. And what happened was that uh, she has a extremely low threshold. So you remember we talk about the threshold of allergen or antigen? She happened to be one of those cases where uh, she already was sensitized and pretty much Information is correct. The information is correct. Now, when I ask this question to a class before you, let's see what their responses were, and you can add if you want to. My question to them was, how would you have avoided such risky behavior? <laughs> okay, that makes sense. <laughs> she probably did be a regret, not much for adrenaline, but you can see that uh, bracelet won't work because you have to have your immune status, and this is known in medical world. <laughs> wow. 
Okay. That's one from the class. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you are really after somebody, that's what you need to do. Should kiss next to the husband. And this is a true fact that uh, medically she was being treated for that. But anyway, immediate hypersensitivity is an anaphylaxis, and that is true. I mean, we can laugh about that because she was a teenager, but just imagine babies, young neonatal babies, and they are have this peanut allergy, and you're giving something in the post or something of that nature, and they go through all that phase. It's very difficult to revive them because the blood pressure falls drastically. Okay? So uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit allergy today some of the features of hypersensitivity that you may have known. Uh, biochemical events of mast cell, there's something that I would want you to get from today's lecture, biochemical events of the mast cell, okay? And then again, pretty much the same story, but uh, as I said the other day, your book basically is, so to speak, outdated. I do int intend to change it next, next year, because you cannot teach from, uh, six, seven year old book. So all that information is good enough for you to know, get to know all the players, <coughs> but information wise, I'll present some of the information which is out there uh, and is important, okay? And before I go back, uh, I don't know how many of you have had an interest, maybe none of you, uh, in history of medicine. Because in medical school, we, are, we were taught history of medicine. So we talked about, you know, Aristotle, many other people that played a part. And immunology actually remained as one of the modern sciences. To such an extent that all the Nobel Prize were given in the last 23, 20 to 30 years to most of the immunologists working as physicians. Okay, I'm just introduced one of the physicians that basically uh, was the pioneer of immunology, or in immunological term, we call him father of immunology. And I, I'll just, a disclaimer is that this is not my photo. There's a disclaimer here. <laughs> well, there were two, two important physicians in the past. I think uh, raises, other name is Razi. And the other person is Ibn Sina, known as Avicenna. So they are considered as the forefathers of immunology, and they were the one who first introduced many things that we are discussing today. And a uh, little bit of, I think, I just, one of, when I was an immunology student, uh, I was really impressed by Razi, and then, uh, Born, I think, is a suburb of Iran. Still, is a part of that array in Iran, and uh, he basically was the first one to mention about hay fever. Hay fever. So hay fever basically was mentioned by him. Uh, I don't know, 900 years or 1,000 years ago, and it was published as a report, uh, which was translated, unfortunately, in 1996 and I was doing my postdoc as one of the original person to talk of seasonal allergic rhinitis. So remember, one of the commonest problem that we have is allergic rhinitis. And one form of the other people are still going into that. And then again, uh, not only this particular person was the beginner and pioneer of hay fever, but he was also the first to introduce measles and smallpox and tell that these are some of the infectious diseases and they were totally separate and they had an immune component to that. Okay? All right. Now, you must have heard about G8 politically, but when we talk of G8, we talk of allergens. G8 allergens. Actually, before I go back, I had 
let me go back once. Okay, I can go back. So uh, many of people, many of you people uh, came to me and they were interested. As I just announced the other day, that one of you had 98 percent score, and they wanted me to introduce that and let the person know. And maybe that happens to be also from Iran, Tehran, and Nas. <laughs> so you can do it. Later. Okay. You're not related to him, do you? Okay. All right. Okay, so these are like G8 allergens. And uh, number one is milk. And I'm not going to go into uh, the geopolitics for that. But right now, uh, there's a big milk lobby. And there are a lot of suits. And many things are happening because uh, other than Caucasians, most of the other people are very, very allergic to cow's milk. So many a problem that we see today is coming from milk, but that would not get into the public because of the big milk lobby. So there are many things which are there, but it is fact that uh, we do see a very high incidence of allergy due to milk or milk products. Wheat is number two, soy, peanut, egg, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. So these are the number one culprits that we normally see in terms of allergy. But the list actually goes on and on. And the question that you may have to ask yourself is that uh, based upon your information of immunology, you can see from here, risk of reaction to at least one. So most of them are fruits, and either they are consumed by a particular group of people, or they basically are a part of the products that we are consuming. And you can see from here, if you look at the percentages, and you will see, like for example, over here, if I can use this over here, uh, cow's milk, 92%. So cow's milk is, is a serious thing in terms of those people who have food allergies. And then you can see so and so forth. Okay? So what's that percentage of cow's milk? People are allergic to that? Well, it basically uh, gives you a relative risk. What are the risks? I'm pretty sure Kumar would have told you what does risk mean and, uh, you know, P interval and conscience interval mean when we say, when we talk about percentages. What does it mean? But again, it's variable. It depends upon a particular state, a particular uh, ethnic group, a particular area, and so on and so forth. So things are not, you know, straight black and white. When you talk about statistics, you can play around with the number, but the only information is that it does play a role. So that's important. Okay? Okay. As I said earlier, uh, Allergic rhinitis, that's for the hay fever that I just told you, the raisins were the first to identify that. And that is the major concern, is a major concern. To such an extent that um, I remember myself when I rotated in ENT, in ENT surgery, uh, honestly speaking, there was no medical cure for allergic rhinitis. So they would do weird type of things that's why, I don't know, many of you know that, if, for example, when I was in Loyola, so allergy department is tied up with ENT, ear, nose, and throat. You can see the major problem that we have in allergy is allergic rhinitis. So people are sneezing, coughing, running nose, and they think that this is flu. They think it's something, but by the end of the day, it's allergy. It would also give an idea that this means allergens are coming from which route? If you have allergic rhinitis, where is the allergen coming from? Air. Air. Airborne. That's why if you do the weather report, you will see the incidence of pollen. And may give you a choice to relocate. Chicago, unfortunately, may not be a good place for those people who have allergic rhinitis to be uh, living in. But these are CDC statistics, so they are for real for USA. So you can see 7.8% of 18 and over have had hay fever in their life. 2010, 10%, and very in uh, other population, very high. And worldwide, 10 to 30% is a lot. 
10 to 30 percent is a lot. I mean, don't underestimate that. If, if they tell you 30 percent of the world, this is a lot of population. And then again, if you do the worldwide sensitization, IG antibody to foreign proteins, it is present in 40 percent of the population. That's why one of the drugs that we are trying to make is targeting IgE because it's a big market there. If you want to come up and work in R&D, if you were to come up and work in a good pharmaceutical company, that's what they're shooting for because they're not going to spend money on us somewhere where they will not get any return. 40% of the population is lost. Okay? And then again, you can see 17.6 adults were hay fever in just 12 months. 12 months. And uh, many of them basically uh, end up being put on uh, anti-allergic drug. And as I said, the, the only good drug that we have right now is chromalin, and that is a mass cell stabilizer. I'm going to discuss that in a while. Drug allergy is again important, but you can see that uh, if you don't remember any side effect or of a drug, just like, like allergy, and that will be true. Because every drug, per se, is designed as a small compound but peptides can attach, and many proteins can tag onto that and cause problems. And you can see 20% uh, of hospitalized patients and 20% of fatalities for anaphylaxis. It's nothing you can do. So there's always a chance that you give a particular drug and 20% of people will fall into that category. Uh, food allergy, again, uh, you will see very common in kids. And then again, uh, there is a list on and on goes, and you will see that we do have millions of people, millions of people, uh, food allergy. And I, I think uh, most of immunologists will blame it on the uh, complexity of food that we take in. You just open up a wrap or candy or any other chocolate, and you see at least 100 different ingredients. It's very tough and uh, to really figure it out, what's going on. But also keep in mind that uh, if you have a problem in the immune system, if you're allergic to one, chances are you're going to be allergic to many other things as well. And in this case, you can see 30% of food allergic have multiple food allergies. So this means if you are allergic to one, chances are you're allergic to other as well, because probably it's coming from IgE. Right? So IgE sensitization is a very important thing. That's another thing I want to discuss today, and I want you to know how do that happen. ID sensitization and what are the drugs in the market that we are trying to come up with and they will help us treat that. Okay? So these, of course, keep on changing. I just downloaded it yesterday from CDC website and American College of Allergy website. So that's another thing. Now, uh, this is how uh, CDC maintains the resources. So you can see from a percentage of children under 18 years of age who have a reported food or digestive allergy in the past 12 months. And this is the most updated. Unfortunately, they didn't do anything after 2007. So that remains. Again, you can see uh, people who are younger than five years have a high allergy as compared to people when, when they get older. And you can also see uh, dichotomy in terms of male and female incidences. If you look at uh, ethnic predisposition, you will see uh, pretty much, I would say, other than Hispanic, pretty much uh, standard there, not much of a difference that you normally see. If you look at the trends overall, like uh, under 18 years of age, and these are food and digestive in 12 months, and you can see uh, there is a about like four to five percent, pretty much across the spectrum, anywhere from the uh, from newborns to 17 years. So you can see the whole idea is that while your immune system is trying to learn what are the allergens in the environment, they kind of get adapted to the situation, and that's what the struggles are in terms of uh, traits. Again, uh, 
If you have food allergy, if you have allergy, again, asthma is going to be a big problem. If asthma is a problem, then again, eczema or skin allergy or respiratory allergy will also be there. And you can see that those people who have food allergy, the chances are that they are, are also going to be uh, falling into that category where we have asthma and skin allergy. So pretty much go hand in hand because of the problems of uh, type 1 hypersensitivity. Okay, and those people who do not have food allergy, well, they can still have asthma, they can still have skin disease, but the incidence is quite low. You can see from here, the incidence is, I would say, dramatically low as compared to those people. Remember today's lecture, I said, if they have one problem, the immune system, it gets compounded with another problem because the whole immune system has to orchestrate immune response. So that's how, uh, you know, things are uh, dealt in immune system. Average number of hospital discharges, again, you will see uh, over here, people who are diagnosed with food allergy. It's pretty high in terms of uh, especially children under 18 years. So you see from here, uh, pediatricians are the one who take care of anybody less than 18. And over 18, again, physicians, general physicians can take over. So there is a trend in the current population in the U.S. where people uh, are having food allergies and many other allergies and asthma and things like that. Okay. Okay. And these are some of the informations that you can see. They are posted on the uh, website. And the whole idea is, remember, when we talk of treatment of allergy, the easiest treatment without the drug will be, what will be the best treatment? Avoid, Avoid the allergen. Simple as that. But of course the problem is, if you're living in Chicago, how are you going to avoid the allergen? In-house. In-house. <laughs> so you have a special air filtering system in your house, not let any air come, then you can uh, be in-house. But that's not a good uh, kind of environment anyway, so you have to stay inside. Okay. And there are many suggestions, uh, but again, uh, one thing is for sure that uh, if you do have family history, genetic history, you should go for allergy testing. This is for sure, because of course trees are to be blamed, especially in Chicago, very high pollen. And then again, uh, grasses, food, mites, cats and dogs, basically for those people who have pets and they don't have medical insurance for the pets and then again you know a lot of things come with the dander urine and pieces of these animals that will get scattered and you will have different uh, molecules which are allergen so you may want to go and test yourself for that because many a time what they do is that they will either sensitize you for that or um, will help you to build up your immunity Okay, you can see this is how uh, dust mite especially looks like, and this is what pollen looks like. You can see the way they, it is like, you know, edges and those kind of horny appearance. So it will be a big problem for a immune system to deal with. And then again, mold is also important, especially uh, if you are a morning person, you know, parks and so and so places, you're gonna go out and run. So molds are there in the atmosphere, and then again, your AC system, all this has to be taken care of, so that's important. So according to the young men, if you have to stay in your home, so make sure that you have a good ventilation system and you get mold tests every day. Okay. All right. Uh, dust mite, you can see dust mite, dander, that kind of comes from the hair of uh, pets, especially dogs. And uh, people, the moment they come near these animals, they start sneezing, and then again, very common uh, for babies, especially if the immune system is not developed. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk about IgE, because I, I told you that IgE, since this, we're talking about type one hypersensitivity reaction, so you, you know what, you, what we have discussed earlier, the moment you come across an allergen for the first time, you get sensitized. 
and your body starts making IgE. And if you pay attention over here, uh, for example, this is basically from birth over time, and these are levels of antibodies. You pretty much don't have any antibody level at birth because the antibody you will have is only that is IgG coming from mother. But as we, uh, as we grow, so you can pick up those antibodies. And again, you will see a trend over here that this baby, seasonal, when she goes through that phase, for example, the pollen is there in spring or fall. So it has this hypes or, you know, these kind of curves over here where the allergen contact causes increased level of IgG. Now, uh, the question you will ask yourself is that uh, IgE is not a protective antibody. What is a protective antibody? IgG. So IgG is a protective antibody. So you want to give this therapy with specific immunotherapy, so we want to have high IgG level. So many a time what we do is that we give prophylactic vaccination at birth. So whole idea is that you have very high IgG and that will basically not let IgE level rise up. Okay? Now the question is, how do you do that? What normally happens is that uh, your body will see an allergen, it will produce IgE. Now you know all this information, and you want body immune cell to tolerate and don't respond to that stimuli with the body needs to put IgE. So you can see from here, tolerance can be induced and then IgE does never reach those levels where it becomes dangerous. Because more IgG, IgE, more it's going to sit on top of mast cells and the more problems that we get. So that's an idea in terms of vaccination point of view. Okay, this is from your uh, Recap from whatever we have discussed so far. Uh, those of you, six of you have had a chance to look at it. So you can see from here, uh, type one, type two, type three, type four. And uh, type one, IgE, soluble antigen, and you can pretty much see you have allergic rhinitis, asthma, systemic anaphylaxis. Type two is typically a cell or matrix associated antigen. Remember I said the other day, that uh, your book is too simple, but the information is getting confused. Now, when you will just read the book, and you will have this impression, I'm pretty sure, and I don't want to change it right now, but you will see over here that when they talk of type four, they usually spend more time on TH1, they will spend less time on TH2. But what is happening these days is that TH2 is the major culprit. So once we know that TH1 cytokines are produced, you can see TH1 cytokines are produced basically, right? And then TH2 cytokines are important because if you don't have TH2 cytokines, you would never get your B cell to do class switching, right? Because one of the purposes will be to make sure that you have long term protective antibodies to help, though it's a cell mediated immunity. Okay, so you can see from here. And then recently, they also added one more uh, player to type 4, which is called CTL. And CTL, as I said, the kiss of death is a cell that's going to attach and kill the cell. That's what it is cytotoxicity. So you have a cell associated antigen. You have a CTL, and CTL will just attach to it and kill it. Now, uh, in the second half of the lecture, I'll talk about penicillin, because that's an important thing that maybe you need to know. So that will, again, be in today's quiz. I'm going to spend a lot of time on penicillin. Uh, how does penicillin cause allergy? And also remember, penicillin, basically, uh, prototype is type 2. So type 2. But having said that, always keep in mind that this is our classification, type one, type two. Body doesn't follow that. So you may 
have a type 1 reaction as well. So don't take it easy, penicillin, no problem. No, it's a big problem. People who may have anaphylactic shock as well. Okay? All right. Okay, again, uh, uh, type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. And uh, as I said earlier, if you look at the mechanism of this slide, is basically to give you an idea about the mechanism of tissue injury. Because by the end of the day, it's a tissue injury. Asthma is a tissue injury. Contact, contact dermatitis is a tissue injury. So uh, in the first part, basically, mast cell is going to release those mediators that are vasoactive means, lipid mediators, and cytokines. You got a perfect storm. All these cytokines are released all of a sudden, and they got drop in the blood pressure. So you can see from here. Whereas in type 2, you can see it's a complement mediated, and then you have a FC receptor coming over here. And the typical problems are when there are receptors for hormone, like acetylcholine receptor, so they will get blocked. And uh, type 4, again, uh, is important, but also keep in mind, as I said this morning, that uh, of all these four different types of allergic reaction, delayed type hypersensitivity is important. And if I was to ask you, uh, in terms of infection, which one of them do you think takes care of infection? Delayed type, right? Because the first one, second one, third one are basically antigen immune complexes. They get deposited for disease. But type 4 is the one because it is uh, initiated by tuberculin, purified protein derivative, which is a product of mycobacterium. So mycobacterium is a nasty bacteria. So we really want to take precautions in that. So mycobacterium tuberculosis causes TB. So that's a major problem. So once we discuss with mycobacterium tuberculosis, leprae, and many other uh, mycobacterium problems that are present, especially in AIDS patients, that poses a big challenge for us. Okay? All right. So let me go through some of the uh, information which is out there other than our textbook. Uh, and then again, uh, I would encourage you, those of you who are interested, uh, there are two top scientific journals, Nature Science, three Nature Science and Cell. And that's why they, they keep on printing uh, some of the uh, updated mechanisms which are there. And those of us like myself who are interested in developing drugs, we want to find out what is going on. And uh, they are presented as reviews. So you can see from here, some of the information will be standard information. Pretty much everybody can figure out. Like for example, number one is a sensitization and memory. So you pretty much know what is sensi sensitization and memory. So what it's talking about is that uh, the allergen basically has a B cell epitope or T cell epitope. So what it's trying to say is that the same allergen has two special amino acid sequence. One will invite a dendritic cell, and other will invite a T cell, a B cell. So you can see over here, uh, and why not T cell? So it has an epitope for a T cell, why doesn't it come and invite a T cell to begin with? Yeah, because T cells would not take a bigger chunk. T cell will always take a small epitope. T cell is an antigen presenting cell. Then it's an antigen. B cell itself is the antigen presenting cell. So you can see from here, again, the same theory. We have that broken up MSC present through TCR. There's a naive T cell, and that naive T cell then differentiates into TH2 cell. So TH2 cell basically, once they are formed, these TH2 cells will send a signal to B cells, and normally B cells are producing IgM and IgD antibodies. So, uh, Two cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, are important. 
and these cells will send a signal to B cell and say, hey guys, we don't want M and D. We, not, we need to have IgE. So IgE would never be produced unless and until there is a TH2 cell. Make sense? And what TH2 cell will do is that it will deal with this B cell to take care of that allergen and send the information in some of the memory cells to store it. In case if this antigen allergen comes again, they will deal with it differently. Make sense? Okay. Now, this is like a, the, the early sensitization. Now, the IgE class switching is produced, IgE attached to mast cells, and when this allergen is exposed the second time, there is a degranulation of mast cells. The mast cell will break apart. Yes or no? Now, this is a review. What they're trying to do is that they are now going to present to you what should be the line of action in terms of development of drugs that uh, we want to stop that happening. And it doesn't take a rocket science to understand because uh, we can stop that. Any step that there's an arrow there, you can put a stop there. Right? You can stop that. You can stop that. You can stop class switching and don't let the error. So there are many mechanisms. But again, since they are specific drugs, so we have to be careful. Okay. Now, the immediate reaction is the IgE sits on top of the mast cell. And why does it sit on the top of the mast cell? Because it has FC epsilon R1 receptor. You can see from here. This is another uh, drug that if you block FC epsilon R1, then IgE may have no place to go and attach to. Does that make sense? Because by the end of the day, you want to stop this degranulation. Because that's where the problem is coming from. Okay. Now, uh, something they call is late reaction. We basically we just came out, uh, so we not even we won't find this information in some of the textbooks as well. <laughs> but what is happening is that uh, if the allergen comes. An allergen basically is going to be seen by antigen presenting cell, right? And then again, it is going to talk to Th2 cell because Th2 cells, the activation of T cells is proliferation. So you need to proliferate, right? So it is going to cause proliferation of Th2 cells, and Th2 cells, which probably were producing IL4 and IL13 normally. Now they produce IL-5 as well. The question is, what is the significance of IL-5? What is the significance of IL-5? Many a time as a rule, if I ask you a question, the answer is already there. Because eosinophil is another type of cell that also carries all this weaponry like a mast cell, and then it will also get degenerated. So problem is compounded. So we don't want to help find the answer. So if you are just reading a textbook 2009, and then by the time you graduate, you go in the industry, talk about IL-5, and many other things, and you, you just get confused. So that's why most of the time for, especially for immunology, uh, I wish there was a, a kind of a, you know, a prerequisite for that. Otherwise, we would have taught you the latest, which was coming last month or last week, actually, because things are drastically changing. Okay. So what's happening in this case is the eosinophil. Because you will ask, why is it? How do we know that? Well, we had developed all the drugs. You just took chromalin, and you thought everything was okay. You still get allergy. So you say to yourself, I block mast cell. But where is this allergy coming from? Because there are other mass cell like cells. They pretty much are they are eosinophil. That's why if you 
run their uh, eosinophil levels, the levels will be high. Does that make sense? To some of you, right? All of you. Okay. Now, again, uh, for another kind of a concept in terms of uh, delay type hypersensitivity reaction. Delay type hypersensitivity reaction. So you can see from here sensitization by some of the hapton sensitization or some other things which are happening on the skin. Because remember, skin is the largest organ and uh, skin, people are very, you know, taking care of the skin, cosmetics and so on and so forth. But uh, anything that you apply on your skin, and interestingly, uh, none of the product is FDA re regulated. None of the cosmetics is FDA regulated unless and until you tell them that it has caused a problem. They don't care. So whatever you want to put on your eyes and your ears on the skin, what on the hair, they don't care. There is no anything that sits in uh, Walmart, Walgreens, doesn't mean anything when it comes to application and ointment. The only thing they regulate is the pharmacy drugs which are antibiotics and anti-cancer drugs and so So what normally happens is, so whatever you apply, it could be light as well, tan as well, whatever is there, basically it is going to sensitize your skin. So you basically are irritating or according to the manufacturer's thing, it's just like they said the skin, you have, well, that's what they say, uh, rejuvenating the skin. And you know who, what rejuvenates the skin? What do they have in the skin to re rejuvenate your skin? Caffeine, because you have that feeling. Uh, so even a drug which is caffeine, is there to make you feel, you know, like high. That's pretty much it. But uh, by the end of the day, what is happening over here is that all those things are going to get sensitized, and your little haptons or whatever they put over here, maybe they, they're testing on you. And then if you report something, and that's what happens. I, I, I'm pretty sure you saw the news from the Walmart uh, thing last week, and it was said that whatever they the ingredients for the herbal medicine or whatever they're putting was not correct. So if they say a particular product, doesn't mean the pure form. It may have 100 more in there. Right? And these are the big companies. But by the end of the day, there's no legality into it. So you have to take your own risk to do whatever you want to do. But that's how the system runs. <coughs> OK? All right. So. Uh, I think what I've talked so far is that uh, these four uh, hypersensitivity reactions give you an idea as to how body deals with different things. Right? And then you'll wonder why on earth do we have IgE antibodies to begin with. But as a rule, remember that everything which is there in the system is for your protection. Does anybody know? What is the good use of IgE? It's not on this slide, I can tell you. What is a good use of IgE? Because right now it seems to me IgE is bad. You want to take all your IgE out. One at a time. Yeah, go ahead. No, she said. Go ahead. Prevents parasitic infection. Parasitic infection, very good. Parasitic infection, helminth infection. So the IgE is good for that, parasitic infection. So body is in a design in a way that a parasitic infection is taken care of for IgE. That is good, that is correct, okay? The other thing is that, uh, remember that uh, mass cell basically is a pharmacy of its own. So we basically are learning what do we have in our mass cell and when we can go from there. Pretty much uh, the general feature of hypersensitivity reactions, all immediate. When we say immediate, we're talking about type 1. When we say immediate, we're talking about anaphylaxis. 
but access means protection, and M means absence of protect, uh, protection that it's coming from. Okay, so another term that we normally use is atopy. So allergy and atopic, so say some patients will say they are atopic, this means allergy. That's the other, not a good term, but you can see over here. And uh, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, atopy means like unusual. For the last hundred years or so, with this industrialization thing which came up, so everything got complicated from eating to drinking to to wearing and you know everywhere. So we basically are testing our immune systems beyond the limits. How many of you have heard about things? You know, sometimes we try to explain and even in terms of scientific basis. And uh, we have to come up with a good, reasonable guess. We call it educate, educated guess. And that educates, educated guess is called, what is it called? Hypothesis. One of the hypotheses is, uh, we call it hygiene theory. Does anybody know what's hygiene theory? Okay. What normally happens is that they think that people in the third world, for example, so their immune system is already fighting microorganisms because the infection, infection these are very high. So immune system is taking full-fledged war with the uh, infectious diseases. So in this part of the world, we don't have that high incidence of uh, infectious diseases because of hygiene. Now we have our share of autoimmune diseases and cancers. So that's basically hygiene theory. They think that, uh, you know, so our immune system is not strong enough because it's not fighting off so, uh, infectious diseases because that part of the world are already developed that uh, kind of resistance and their uh, immune system is pretty strong. But over here, because you put yourself in an isolated area and you take an extra care for your hygiene, and there you go, then your immune system is going to go for other players, other, like autoimmune diseases and so on and so forth. So that, that basically is, a, is kind of a, a, a hypothesis that they still think. It may not be true, though, because hypotheses can be uh, you know, wrong, or they have to, unless prove otherwise. OK. I think the, we already talked about that. Nothing special about that. Uh, I think I did mention strong genetic predisposition, because uh, class switching, if you remember, is coming from your antibody diversity, hypermutation, and all those kind of genes that you inherited from your father and mother. So if you already have picked up a, a genetic predisposition that you have an ability to make more IgE, so you basically are going to produce more IgE. That's, that's about it. So there is a very strong uh, genetic predisposition where uh, your body may have, I mean, all of us can go for IgE levels. We may have like some static ID level, but if we are having a lot of allergies, so we can test our ID level. That will give you an index for that. And again, uh, as it says over here, these are allergens are antigens, but basically uh, environmental proteins and chemicals. That's what we normally see. Okay. Remember I said, uh, that we initially thought Th1 cytokine, but again it's Th2. And I gave you the reason for that, because Th2 cytokines are there that will release IL-4 and IL-13 to cause the class switching of B so they can make IgE. And that's pretty much talks of that. And then again, uh, also keep in mind, as we uh, discussed earlier as well, that when you have uh, a sudden release of mast cell, and mast cell has all different kind of vasoactive drugs. They, depending upon where is it released, if it's in your airway, it's going to cause swelling there. If it's in your DIT, it's going to cause diarrhea there. And if it's a local over there, it will cause inflammation there. So these are some of the things which are there. Okay. Uh, immediate hypersensitivity to skin, skin and mucus allergy, food allergies, asthma, and systemic anaphylaxis. These are the common things that you normally see. Uh, 
Again, allergic rhinitis, I already told you. Food allergies basically are type 1. Right? Food allergies are type 1. Asthma is type 1. Right? Okay, now, uh, this is a photomicrograph of a basophil and a eosinophil. Remember, we talked about uh, these cells are called granulocytes. These are called granulocytes because they contain granules there. So they are granules over there, called cytoplasmic granules. And these are loaded with all those uh, pharmaceutical agents that I said that uh, are important in, in mast cells. Okay? So you can see from this is how they look like under the microscope. So in the previous figure, we had an eosinophil, eosinophil as well. But remember, basophil also fall into the same category. So basophil plus uh, what do you call um, mast cells are the major pairs. So that's a Spanish elective. If you ever want to take a Spanish elective, so once I pass over there, I saw whole class dancing. I said, "What's going on?" So that's a Spanish elective that you want to take in your P2 class. Okay. So. Uh, Mass cells, you can see, this is a real-time mass cell. Can you close the door? Mass cell, and you can see the nucleus is there, and there are tons of, tons of, tons of bags full of histamine. That's where the commonest allergy drug is antihistamine. That's where it is coming from. But it will, again, cause a lot of problems, the, you know, so and so forth. But histamine is, is a major vasoactive, and many others as well. But you can see this is the real picture of a typical mast cell, and this is how uh, within the nucleus and all these bags. So what did, what did I tell you? When the mast cell degranulates, what happens then? So it is, say it again? So what happens to the mast cell then after that? It dies. It dies. Do you agree with that? Yeah. No. Why? <laughs> It rejuvenates. It, it basically regenerates. No, it, it rejuvenates. It comes back again. So don't think that it releases. It has an ability to do that. Okay? Okay, now uh, let's compare. Uh, so these are the players uh, for type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, and that's where the drug companies are interested in. And that's what they want to go after. So you can see that they all have a characteristic. Right? So let's look at the characteristics first. For example, major site of maturation, mass cells are in connective tissue. This means in the tissue, whereas the other two are in bone marrow. Major cells in circulation. These are in the tissue and they are circulating. So they are a problem then. And they are running around in your circulation. Mature cell recruited into tissues for circulation, yes, and mass cell is okay. Mature cell residing in connective tissue, yes. Proliferative ability of mature cell, that is a big plus for, for mass cell. Those two cannot proliferate, but mass cell can proliferate. So it's going to compound the problem. It also will cause, uh, you know, more of a IgE attachment is going to uh, lifespan weeks to months, and basophils days like two to twenty-two hours, whereas eosinophils, some of the diseases we call it eosinophilia. So if you do the tissue biopsy, you see a lot of eosinophils sitting over there. And then uh, FC, epsilon R1, very high levels. What does that mean? If they have high levels of that receptor that binds IV. The more I need you will bind, the more the problem is. And what are the major granules that are released? Histamine, heparin, chondritin sulfate, proteases. Pretty much the same. But you can see from here, eosinophils had many other killing abilities like new proteins. We have had ionic proteins as well. But that's another problem if 
a tissue is infiltrated with all those enzymes. So these are all bleaches. So they are all bleaches over there that will cause the problem. Okay. The summary of the events that uh, we discussed about, and this is one of the slides that I think I did post it to you. Uh, I'll pick up one question from there because it's very important. This is like a master slide, whatever you have talked, so please pay attention to that. So you can see, uh, these are some of the steps. First, exposure of al allergen, activation of Th2 cells and stimulation of Ig class switching. We produce IgE, IgE binds to Fc, Fc1R1. You have a repeated exposure, activation of mast cell, mast cell bursts open, and it releases what it contains. And then again, there are immediate reactions because of vasoactive means, and then cytokines can basically come later. So this is a sequence of events that normally we come across in terms of an allergen being introduced into your body. Okay, now, uh, antigen binding of IgE, you can see IgE binds to FC epsilon R, and then again, if you remember the important concept that uh, unless and until you cross-link two IgE molecule, the signal will not go in. And you can see from here, there is a cross-linking by this particular uh, antigen and that will cause the release and you can typically see the release. Uh, this is a, a mast cell It's going to degenerate and then you know push all these granules into the system. Uh, I did say that I don't want you to remember the intracellular signaling but for today's because I, for this part at least I do, because most of the drugs that you will see are here. So this is basically a biochemical uh, pathway for mass cell activation, because remember, we need to stop them. We need to stop them. Okay? Now, these are like seven events, and I want you to remember in that sequence, number one, pretty much the same cross-linking of bound IgE. There's an activation of tyrosine kinases. The next slide will give you the, uh, the cartoon for that. And then there is an activation of MAP kinase. And then again, there is a phosphoinositol PLC gamma catalyzation along the intracellular membrane. And then these basically will activate the calcium. And finally, uh, it will init initiate the synthesis of uh, lipid mediators. Because remember, mast cell has some of the mediators that are uh, already there, pre-formed mediators, we call they're already there. And some of them need a signal for the novo synthesis. So these are some of the mediators that you will see will come in like a de novo synthesis in these uh, particular cases. So this is what, uh, the whole sequence of event is that if you want to design the drugs for allergy. And uh, you can see from here, right on the top, you have uh, FC epsilon R1 receptor. And you have two IgE, they got cross linked by an allergen. And then uh, the sequence of events follow. And you have, again, the MAP kinases. And these MAP kinases will send a signal to uh, PIP2, and then the whole idea is that you need to make sure that those particular cytokines like IL-4 and IL-13 are synthesized. So they will only be synthesized when there is a message sent to the nucleus to produce those cytokines. So that is called a signaling pathway, outside in signaling pathway, where uh, things can happen. Now what you will see in this slide is that again, if it's a mast cell, there are there's another pathway. This is a phosphatidylcholine pathway, which is an echidonic pathway, 
where you have prostaglandins. That's the prostaglandin pathway where your crops inhibitors, you know, the pain relieving uh, drugs that we normally use are there. But they basically are bypassing all that. So this means that you can have immediate release of lipid mediators. They don't have to go through that signaling pathway. And these are prostaglandins. And on the other hand, uh, some of the histamine basically is also already stored uh, over here in terms of already granules which are there. So you can see the complexity of the mast cell thing where uh, we need to control all those granules which are there. If you just give antihistaminic, for example, if you give antihistaminic, there will be a very rough treatment for allergy. That's not a good treatment for allergy, especially for prevention of asthma. Nobody's going to give antihistaminic to prevent asthma. You have to come up with cytokine inhibitors. You have to come with prostaglandin inhibitors. And you have to come many other drugs which are there for you to properly take control of asthma that these people have. OK? OK, let's uh, look at uh, the clinical effects of uh, whatever mast cell release. So mast cell or basophil, they are going to release this mediator. Now the question is, what does this mediator do? Uh, biogenic amines and lipid mediators, they will cause vascular leak, bronchoconstriction, that's where the asthma is coming from. And then they will call intestinal hypermotility. Whereas cytokines like TNF and other lipid mediators, they will cause inflammation. The enzymes will call tissue damage, which is tryptase. And then remember I said that these are the special things that we have for eosinophils. Eosinophils are required to take control of parasites. You can see they basically are there to kill parasites, but they can also cause tissue injury if the allergen also incites their release. So this is something that we normally see. Okay? Uh, type four, basically, you can see over here, uh, sorry, is this still a type one? So is a tissue over here, is, you can see the mast cell, it has all those granules and then eosinophils are here. So if you do a biopsy of uh, a lesion where you see anaphylaxis, so you will typically see a, uh, a immediate reaction and the late reaction, the reason being because some of the mediators are released as a preformed mediators available right away and some of them are de novo synthesis. They have to take some time before they are released. So people will go through that phase. Okay. Uh, this is uh, type four. Again, you can see from here, you give intradermal injection, and then you will see a typical, we call it wheel and flare reaction. So that's what you look at the PPD. And what is happening is that, um, in this case, a typical reaction to a allergen. So that will respond in terms of that. Okay. Last few slides for some of the drug. Uh, you can see this from the nature unit drug discovery. Some some of the drugs which are in the market or in, in coming in the market. And again, you will see the idea is that uh, they pretty much know that this is a typical type one hypersensitivity reaction. Mass cell is there, eosinophil is there, they pretty much know what their problems are, and all the players are there. Now they want to, in this case, want to come up with a with a, a blocker, for example, in this case you can see IL-4 blocker. So if you can block IL-4, you pretty much will block class switching. And when you block class switching, no IGG. So that's where some of the drugs like are uh, <clears throat> happening because this is a typical asthmatic person with this constriction of mucosa.
Another drug delivery uh, slide again. Remember we talked this morning about uh, some of the cells that need to pass through endothelium and go in the tissues. Because that may happen in inflammation when you have your brown fat inflamed. You want to stop that. So you can go after attachment, rolling, and transmigration. So that's another avenue for drug development. And we talked this morning of addressants and integrants that could go and stop that. So that's another avenue over here. Okay. Again, a drug discovery. Because the idea is that this is an airway, right? The person is asthmatic. This is an airway, and these are lining of epithelium. They are smooth cells. So there's a mucosa, edema over there. The muscles contract, human is closed, and pe pe a person is asthmatic. Now, we know what are the cytokines released by TH2. We know the role of mast cell. We know the role of eosinophils. And we pretty much know TH2-specific chemokines. What does this suggest to you if I ask you, why are we worried about TH2-specific chemokines? Again, chemokines are those chemicals that they will invite TH2 cells to come over here. Because if they don't come over here, they would not do local damage. So chemokines are some of the chemicals that are released. And there are many different specified, so all the, there are four line of drugs over here that will stop chemokines. And then we have receptor blocker over here to block over here. Then we have uh, some of the blockers for IgE receptor sites. We can block over here. Then we can have some of the blockers for the receptors on this. You can see receptor signaling pathway is basically where most of the drugs are targeted. They are protein. <coughs> Either it can be a blocking antibody for the drugs, or it can be different type of you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines that are there and they can be rectified in terms of response. And this is basically a picture of a patient with asthma. So you can see the asthmatic patient has all those cells with lymphocyte and eosinophil. So that's what are causing damage and that's where the thickening of mucosa is taking place. Okay. Again, uh, you can see from here uh, the current therapy. The current therapy, which is out there for asthma, as I said, chromalin. Chromalin is there in the market. Chromalin is available. But what it does is that it just basically uh, stops the degeneration. So it will stop all these things. So there will not be bronchoconstriction. Right? Or what they normally do is that these days they give steroids as well. So chromalin plus steroids. So steroids will take care of biogenic amines. So if you know the cascade of events, and then you have this red line, so you can have a chromalin, stop all that over here. If you have a corticosteroids, stop all this over here. That's what the normal current therapy for asthma is. Okay. I think I'll, I'll stop here and 